morning. Trumptopia. A special segment of the almost daily Zencast. Countdown Madness 2020. A special, special segment. here election madness hello and namaste my dear friends and listeners and fellow human beings it is tuesday october 20th 2020 and i'm sure numerologists are doing something with this number in fact i I'm fairly certain I saw some meme about it in anticipation several months ago. Um, but, you know, darn numerologists will see what they want to see in those darn numbers. Uh, not that I have a beef with numerologists. No offense. Numbers are fascinating and math is magic. Okay, so on this, uh, thankfully, chill and finally a bit late in the season sort of fall type ish day for Southern California. Closest thing to seasonal change we get. Um, It finally feels like it's here. That's uh, something to be grateful for. uh, Because, you know, the whole state's on fire. And it's easy to forget if you're not, like, right up in it. But let's take a moment to send our thoughts and prayers in that meaningful way, not in that sarcastic, bullshit, empty-ass way, to those who are nearby and or have been suffering because of those um, super climate events. I'm going to do a whole episode and talk about that. And I've talked about fires and the uh, seemingly inescapable conspiracy theories that follow them in previous episodes. Hunt around. I'm sure there's a title that's got something to do with something that connects right here. Uh, But I digress. The uh, the theme of today is Election Day, Election Season, as they're lovingly calling it now. Uh, and just so that you know, dear friends, as we kick off the show, as it stands right now, we are 13 days, 13 hours, and 59 minutes away from it being, quote-unquote, Election Day. And uh, there's a lot to say and unpack about it. Um, Oh, by the way, that countdown is uh, courtesy of timeanddate.com. They are not paying me to mention them. I just figure I should should honor the fact that I'm reading their clock. For those curious, um, the same site has a page that uh, breaks down how long Donald Trump has been in office. And it has been 1,369 days, 10 hours, 1 minute, and 39 seconds since Friday, January 20th, 2017 at 12 midnight. Uh, So, time waits for no man. (laughs) Uh, and I'm, I haven't been, but I figure for shits and giggles, we might, uh, start peeking into that for the show. Uh, according to howlonguntiltrumpleaves.com, there are 91 days, 11 hours, 57 minutes, and 46 seconds left to go. So, buckle in. It's gonna be a wild ride by anybody's estimation. 
And uh, I've got a lot to say about that. But since uh, pro forma, I don't know if I just used that phrase right or not, but it felt like the right thing to say. Um, in other words, to, to be of a form, right? No, that's not what that word phrase means. It means something else specific in Latin, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> for the purposes of feeling nerdy, I'm going to now kick off the show by playing the old school intro. That first track, by the way, was uh, a Remix Live artist remix by DJ Z of uh, an artist by the name of Wood. So a Wood 101 remix uh, entitled Cinematic Heights by the uh, beloved and fictional digital DJ, DJ Z, from his forthcoming non-existent album, Starting Over, Volume 1. Uh, but now, for those who long to hear it, because it hasn't been played in ages, uh, for those who've never heard it before, because you're just joining us here on the show for the very first time, here's the old school intro. of other things too uh so oh i wanted to follow up welcome to the show folks it is yours truly and my very own radio talk show opinion show styled audio pod blog whatever you want to call this it's me rambling at you for often undetermined amounts of time almost daily, uh, around my extremely busy schedule of surviving the end of the world again. And mind you, that takes a lot of effort, especially uh, from, you know, I'm coming at it from a Zen perspective, not so much a paranoid prepper perspective. So it's a whole nother level of crazy. And of course, there's a lot of sarcasm and cynicism in my voice. I think you should be able to tell. Uh, or maybe you can't. I don't know. But I wanted to button this up. I wish I had opened this page up yesterday when I was rambling about free speech. Head on over, if you will, so that you can verify for yourself that I'm not just making things up. Head on over to uscourts.gov. Don't sue me, website. This is me asking for permission to, uh, for the purposes of edutainment, uh, reference this page that you have about federal courts forward slash educational resources forward slash about educational outreach forward slash activity resources forward slash what does. But if you Google freedom of speech, this should come up uh, up there. And if you Google United States courts and freedom of speech as keywords, remember what keywords and how they work, um, you should get this page mighty quick. And I thought this was fascinating because they've got like the fundamental like bullet points. Uh, sort of condensing all of um, setting aside, quote unquote, the common sense interpretation. Setting aside whatever presumed common use uh, you know, uh, assumed mental image of what freedom of speech might mean. Here, according to our own system that we supposedly pledge allegiance to, <clears throat> and we can put a pin in that whole concept in a hot, for a hot second, because I'm going to do a, a revisit on the theme of like, where, what are we pledging our allegiances to as a species? Right? And big questions. Big questions on this show, folks. But so, what does freedom of speech mean? According to uh, 
uscourts.gov, they open with this statement. Among other cherished values, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. The U.S. Supreme Court often has struggled to determine what exactly constitutes protected speech. The following are examples of speech, both direct words and symbolic actions that the court, capital C, has decided are either entitled to First Amendment protections or not. And it includes a little reference. The First Amendment states in relevant part that Congress shall make no law, dot, 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 because they are, they are themselves abridging the statement, abridging freedom of speech. There are, of course, other parts to that sentence. Um, but then it goes into two lovely bullet points. Freedom of, and the two lists are entitled uh, consecutively in this order. Freedom of speech includes the right, and then it's got a one, two, three, four, five, six bullet point list. And then freedom of speech does not include the right. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, let's, I'm going to go, I'm going to take them in reverse order of listed, okay, from the bottom up. So starting in deep, deep in the pocket of does not include. So whatever you think freedom of speech may or may not be or should be, it explicitly excludes. It does not support, endorse, or protect um, the right of students to advocate illegal drug use at a school-sponsored event set by the president of Morris versus Frederick, 2007. Of course, president case is what's listed here, right? Uh, the right of students to make obscene speech at a school-sponsored event. Bethel School District, number 43, versus Frazier, 1986. The first case was from 2007. Um, the right to permit, these are not rights. You do not have the right to permit students to print articles in a school newspaper over the objections of the school administra administration, no matter what your free speech rights theoretically are, in high school, as a journalist, on your school paper, you ain't got them. According, set by the president of Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer, forgive me if I butchered that pronunciation, from 1988, you do not have the right to burn your draft cards as anti-war protest, which to me is bunk. But what else? Um, actually, all of these are bunk. Um, but we'll get into that in a second. To burn draft cards, right? That's United States versus O'Brien from 1968. <clears throat> the second item on the things that are not included under freedom of speech to make or distribute obscene materials, Roth versus United States from 1957. And that I agree with. There's, <clears throat> we need as a society some common sense boundaries for the children and for anybody who wishes to live free of <clears throat> a certain bandwidth of possible content that theoretically could be considered and I hesitate this, and I'm not necessarily trying to be hypocritical here, but, you know, I see all sides. I try to see all sides and then find my my center, right? Um, but you see where I'm going. There's content that people will want to not have to be exposed to. And there's got to be, like, a soft boundary and a hard boundary. And privacy works in there and blah, 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 blah. That's a whole complex issue. But, of course, the question becomes, what is obscene and what is not obscene? And who, who decides that? And where do we draw that line? Sticky, thorny questions. Um, <clears throat> and here, I think currently, given our current real-life milieu, uh, or zeitgeist, as it were, is a critical, and I would argue, uh, argue you know, one can make the argument, presumably the most important. 
the freedom of speech does not, and I think they should have included all caps not, as, you know, with even maybe italicized, right, for the extra emphasis. Uh, the freedom of speech does not, all caps italics, include the right to incite actions that would harm others. And it's got this sort of ridiculous, but also still very salient example, I suppose. Um, example, shouting fire in a crowded theater. And this was decided uh, by a case entitled Sheck versus Schenk uh, versus the United States, 1919. Dare I say that there is quite a bit of content being bantied about both spoken, given as speech, as public speech, uh, and, quote, shared or published on the many platforms that, that comprise the social media spheres that infringes one or more of these <laughs> points. <clears throat> All right, so let's not go down that rabbit hole just now. What does freedom of speech include? Freedom of speech includes the right to engage in symbolic speech. Uh, for example, burning the flag in protest. That is protected activity. You can't citizens arrest someone for burning a flag. You can't beat the shit out of someone for burning the flag. That's assault. That's protected symbolic speech, according, you know, decided by the case law of Texas versus Johnson uh, from 1989, and also United States versus Eichmann, 1990. Uh, freedom of speech protects the right to advertise commercial products and professional services, with some restrictions, in parentheses, Virginia Board of Pharmacy versus Virginia Consumer Council. Oh, there goes my my wake up alarm call. I woke up much earlier than my alarms today. And I should make sure that they're all off so they don't ring in the middle of the show again. Okay. Uh, which was a case from 1976, as well as Bates versus State Bar of Arizona from 1977. So with restrictions, which I'm sure fluctuate in their order and number and uh, severity and also vary by state, um, you do have the right to advertise commercial products and professional services. And presumably, <clears throat> there is this never-ending fight, you know, a good fight for truth in advertising. Moving on. <clears throat> Now, this one's a questionable one in my book. But free speech can, uh, does indeed protect the right to contribute money, parentheses, under certain circumstances, end parentheses, or closed parentheses, to political campaigns. Buckley versus Vallejo, 1976. The year I got here. The year I got stranded on this dusty old rock. Um, I have mixed feelings about that, but also can see that perhaps we just need very stringent controls and requirements for transparency under the under certain circumstances clause, as opposed to just striking that. But like I said, I'm not going to go down the individual rabbit holes just now. Because uh, I gotta wrap this up, move on to other parts of the show. To use, okay, you have the right to use certain offensive words and phrases. And this I didn't realize. I knew that you had the right to uh, use foul language, but I didn't realize that it was so directly attached to uh, the purposes of conveying political messages. 
as decided by Cohen versus California in 1971, to use certain offensive words and phrases to convey political messages. Interesting. Fucking interesting. <clears throat> we have always been a country, uh, I think we were heavily and perhaps unduly influenced by the Brits in this as our, as our immediate forefathers figuratively uh, as one nation gave birth to another for, in all the grotesque ways that that happened. Um, for they, I think, it could be said, also love their foul language and protect the right to... Maybe not so much in their... I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But, you know, just from watching British movies or American movies set in England, what, what do I know about British people? I've only been there twice. Um, and yeah, everybody likes to curse. And so we've apparently in America enshrined that, <laughs> especially for political purposes. Curiously, let's, let's just put this out loud out there for future contemplation. Isn't it fascinating how, and this is one of those things where I get it, right? This is why Trump was appealing and I guess to some degree remains appealing to many, uh, Americans slash Trumptopians. The sphere of public political speech is a sort of hyper clean language space to coin a term. It's a you know you know if you know how gun advocates mock gun free zones and and rightly so to a certain extent, in as much as that we don't. I mean, we use them in such a weird way and such a silly way. Um, but that's a whole other rabbit hole of an episode or series of episodes that we could do, which we'll hopefully return to the board one day with all these pins gathering dust. Uh, but in politics, and, and not that Trump is running around making speeches dropping F-bombs, uh, and that would be like... My, it, I don't think I would ever want to run for politics, um, but I would. I think I could. I could imagine myself uh, being like a fringe person, a facilitator, maybe a speechwriter. Right? Like that's the the one area I think I fit. Where like, help me comprehend what the hell bloody fuck this law is supposed to really be about, and I will write this. Help you write the speech that that conveys it with conviction clarity, transparency, truth, and all the, like, speechiness that you want. Um, so there you go, future politicians. Uh, you know, will work for money <laughs> is my card, imaginary cardboard sign. But I digress. It's a fascinating thing, and it's one of those aha moments that for people who don't understand why Trump was popular or remains popular or supportable to those who do support him is that he seems to violate the this hip, apparently to some from some perspectives to some people's eyes hypocrisy of american politics and that's that it is hyper politically correct and i'm not necessarily against political correctness i'm also not overly burdened by it right like i my awkward uh rambly Rough Around the Edges podcast is riddled with foul language. And I hope in a sort of mildly entertaining, that's just the way this character speaks kind of way and not in in the format that's like, I'm not trying to be a shock jock to reference, you know, a term of art from, uh, you know, the radio industry, uh, my formative years back in the day. Uh, but I digress. It's a fascinating thing, and we'll have to come back to that. But I digress. Uh, to round off the list, the freedom of speech explicitly protects the right of students. And this is a weird one that's like, wait, what? The, the, the right of students to wear black armbands to school to protest war. When was the last time any student did that? For reals. I haven't heard. I mean, when was the last time that was on the news? Who knows? Well, if you if you have done that recently, or if you know someone who's done that, or have heard stories told of some legendary student in recent living memory that has done that, 
Obviously, students did that back in the day, and there was a great big old court case about it. Um, and, the, and here is an irony, right? Because, hold on a second, wait for it. There's like a quote in brackets, in parentheticals. So bullet point number two uh, is the right of students to wear black armbands to school to protest a war. Parentheses, quotes, students do not shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate, period, close quote, close parentheses, as decided in Tinker versus Des Moines, 1969. That, what's that other one from, oh, <clears throat> so freedom of speech boldly declares that students do not shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gates, except for when they work on the school newspaper and the school administration, whoever they may be, have objections to the journalism. <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. Now, is this, a, is this an aberration? Is this a quirky weirdness that's just to be giggled at and hopefully corrected someday by some future legislators? Uh of a youthful nature. Who knows? One of the, uh, if I may sidebar for a hot second, folks. One of the projects of many sub-projects of side spin-off-y things that I want to do is a special, like I want to record it in depth, in length, let it be as long as it's going to be, and then like drop teaser nuggets of it here on the main feed for the Almost Daily Zencast. Then then tease you over to the, you know, because I can have many shows on my Sprecher account. Um, but I want to do a special series where I, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo, respectfully and critically, like a thinking man's look at the, the actual text of the Constitution, it gets waved around. It gets talked about with deep emotional, passionate admiration, respect, and devotion. And it gets discussed and argued about and interpreted. Um, and it is itself, as an organizational document, used as a wedge issue in this country. Multiple emojis of stroking the chin going, hmm, why should that be the case? Who knows? Uh, but let's let's hit finish off this bullet point, take a quick audio musical entertainment break, and then come back to the main thrust of today's episode. So the final bullet point, uh, freedom of speech includes the right not to speak, specifically the right not to salute the flag, which is interesting because that's already not speech. It's another action. West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett from 1943. So there it is, America. On the, There's a couple of interesting flag things here, right? Uh, and as an interesting sidebar, especially to... Uh, it's it's one of those things that I, I delight in pointing out because it's one of those, hmm, curious, I didn't realize kind of things about Americana, about, about this nation, which we all love in our own ways, right? And that we are all also being driven uh, into arguing about the best ways of being part of this nation by all these wedge issues. And I don't mean to make a wedge issue out of it, but I, it already sort of is. It's sitting there waiting to be like uh, rediscovered and get gotten enraged about. Uh, and I do not mean to offend people, but this is the level of absurdity, and this is not new. I'm not. I'm not a Trump, uh, a blind, irate Trump delusional berater of the great orange chosen one. I mock him and and criticize him and exercise my free speech right to parody and political satire and political critique um, because he is a public figure and has been for a long time. 
He is a media mogul, as it were. Uh, he is someone who opines his opinion overtly long before he got into the White House. Uh, and when you, you know, when you do that, uh, you, I guess you sort of earn a little bit of exposure, right? To a certain degree. I also respect his privacy, right? Like, uh, and there's also sort of national security, blah, blah, blah issues, et cetera, et cetera. All of which at some point we'll get into some deep discussion about. But um, to get to this point about the flag and the curious curiosity about our, our legal system, shocker news to some people. And I, and I, I love to point this out, um, and I always pray that it doesn't offend. So I kind of bracket it with too many apologies. But dear, dear American patriots who love all their objects that have flag design, American flag um, imagery, printed, designed into it, woven into it, etc. at all. Technically speaking... According to the black letter of the law, ain't none of that legal. Now, I'm the first to say that like laws should not be blindly adhered to, right? There's a bunch of redonkadonk laws still on the books because people get lazy and people forget that they're there, etc. And plenty of, of media coverage has been devoted to the absurdly silly laws that are still in the books. We'll put a pin in that. We should probably do a recap episode of our own here at the show. Uh, lacking the resources to have a funny list waiting for you right now in this moment. Just sort of imagine it for yourself based on or go dig up weird laws, silly, bizarre, stupid laws. Mix up the keywords for yourself and you'll find a bunch. They tend to be reported out state by state. So look for local coverage. It's kind of hilarious. Um, but when it comes to the flag... I don't think this, I don't know where we stand on this. And I think a lot of people are just either blissfully unaware or blatantly choosing to just wink and ignore it because they love the Americana. They love the kitsch. They love the cowboy hats that are, you know, that faded red, white, and blue print. They love the neckerchiefs and the t-shirts and the cowboy uh formal fandangly dress shirts and the, everything that's got an American flag on it, printed, reproduced, somehow depicted on it, probably is in violation. Seriously speaking, like it's technically against the law. But forever now, we have winked, winked, nudge, nudge, never changed the law and sort of uh, gave it a ha ha, say no more, say no more sort of pass. Now, am I am I outraged? Absolutely not. I think it's adorable. Would I uh which way would I go if we said let's vote on it? I don't know. Especially since according to the system, I'm technically a toaster oven, don't really have voting rights here. But that's a whole nother issue. Um I do have free speech rights and I'm allowed to have opinions about that which we are voting. So we shall take a moment to the uh decalcify the pineal gland and purge the mind for a moment. Join me in unwinding and resetting for Hot Second Friends uh, as we come back and talk about the, uh, the current political climate as we uh, barrel full speed towards the long-awaited, much prophesized about, often um, comedically referenced, uh, election of all elections, the 2020 election.
That was Progressive House 2 Remix. Standing Dive. DJ Z. Starting over, Volume 2. Welcome back, friends and listeners. Uh, it's Tuesday, October 20th. I am your humble, eccentric host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. A little maintenance here so my list doesn't get too crazy. That one track wouldn't play. Sometimes that happens. All right. So what the bloody hell are we talking about? Oh, I wanted to take a hot second as we kick off this uh, back half of today's um, double wide episode. I'm tinkering with uh, what works the most, folks. Uh, as it says on the cover... For the show, the Almost Daily Zencast, hosted by moi, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. For those wondering how to spell that, it's capital T, the, space, incorrigible, I-N-C-O-R-R, two R's right there. That's where you get, that's where it screws me up. I-G-I-B-L-E, that's a real word. I chose it. For a reason. I've had, actually, I've had listeners write in, because cause, y'all do sometimes. People will, like, stumble across uh, my Facebook often, and uh, and we'll get into chatting and ask me a series of questions that wind up ending in, you know, them being curious about the podcast. Um, so they'll be like, well, where do I find it? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, they'll come over and they'll... Thing about who, and I've had I've had m- more than a couple, not an overwhelming number, but like three or four, ask me like, "What is that word? Is that a real word? Like, what what is that?" <laughs> and I'm like, "That's a real word, man. It means something, and uh, it might be silly and convoluted, but there you go, Mister Zeppo. That's Mister with no period. Uh, Zeppo, Z E P P O." Uh, and this is an experimental, quote, talk radio style, end quote, podcast show, uh, where I quite ramblingly and uh, unscriptedly and often um, disorganizedly explore uh, my limited perspective, you know, because, you know, we all have a limited perspective. I pre- I do not pretend to be all-knowing or all-seeing or uh, in any way, shape, or form absolute anything in any way like that, Uh, but exploring my personal perspective on the radical intersection of politics, society, and spirituality in an unorthodox fashion with Muzak. It's supposed to read Muzak. It says music on the page. I need to update that. Uh, And I have some asterisks, some notes there. By experimental, I'm overtly referencing the late 15th century uh, sort of sense of the word, as it says, and I think I pulled this from dictionary.com, parentheses, in the sense, quote, of having a personal experience, also experienced or observed, from the medieval Latin, experimentalis, and from the Latin, experimentum. Uh... What the fuck is that supposed to mean? That means that I'm experimenting with my own experience of doing the show. If I have fun doing the show, then I feel like the show goes well, uh, etc. And I'm also experimenting with, uh, you know, the audience experience. And I need a slightly larger audience with, and a slightly more steady flow of feedback. And then the show will sort of morph and start to take shape as that interaction grows. But, you know, you know what they say. It takes 10 years to become an overnight success. And I've only been at the show for three years. So here we go. Um, But I wanted to take a moment to, uh, A, sort of read that formal uh, placard from the sprecher.com forward slash show forward slash Zencast profile page for the show. It's the official blah blah So I, you can listen to this on whatever podcast catcher you catch it on. 
But uh, if you ever want to give the show a boost and or become part of the community, this is one of the main p central pillars. Not a lot of activity, I'll admit to you, but you know, like I was saying, 10 years, three years in. Um, but every once in a while, I take a peek at the numbers because as an account holder, I get to see a little bit of, um, what do they call them? Uh, you know, your statistics, your analytics. That's the word. And uh, so we're, we're slowly making our way towards a, um, a particular landmark. There's, there's 340 episodes, three, sorry, 348 episodes currently. There's probably in the history of the show slightly more, as I've uh, over-explained in the past. I started the show one way and I kind of fumbled my way through revamping it and I did a dumb thing. I should have left everything exactly the way it was, both for the analytics and sort of just the archival purposes. Um, but that's a whole long story and I won't get into it. But, uh, but yeah, the interesting thing I wanted to take a moment to highlight and say thank you to and shout out and send a namaste to everybody um, is that earlier I was looking at the year-to-date uh, listeners count on a month-to-month -month breakdown. So it's October now. Last October, according to uh, my, uh, my uh, dashboard here, I had a grand total of 214 listeners. And then so through into the end of the year, I kind of had a slump in December and went down. November, 199 listeners. December, 104 listeners. I'm not complaining. I'm just reading off the facts here. Uh, January, 160 listeners. So I just wanted to say thanks and send out some love and appreciation because I don't think I created a lot of content this time, that time of year last year. And I intend to do the opposite. I intend to make more content this year through the holidays. I think last year I kind of tapped out from the the majority of that time. So the fact that there was any listeners listening to the show is kind of awesome. And so I don't know if any of y'all still listening or if you got burnt out and you're like, okay, this guy's crazy. Um, but uh, if you are, if you were amongst those listeners, hello and thanks and namaste at you. I just want to share the overall trends because let's be honest, we're all on this hustle of trying to make it, whatever the fuck that means on the internet, right? Because working from home is the new normal. And uh, here's my legit, serious, like starting run rehearsal, rehearse my way into it, kind of jump at that. February, we had a nice uptick, 294 listeners. Um, the rest of the year has been this interesting rolling build. We got some highlights here. March 271, a dip in April to back down to 195. These are unique listeners that did a different, you know, whatever array of downloading. Those those are different numbers. The download numbers are different numbers. Um, so 244 in May, June 217. It pops up to 467 listeners in July. Now, I don't know what I did different. I don't know what I did special. Uh, or if I just, there was just a spurt of people getting intrigued and engaged by it. But there you go. In August, 454. September, a bit of a slowdown, but I also was off the air a bit. Uh, and maybe this really does just directly correlate to the relation. If there's a direct corollary, I, I, I'm not, I don't have, there's analytics, but I don't have like the, the hardcore scientific breakdown to say uh, that, you know, oh, when I slow down and kind of take a few days off or whatever, uh, you know, that's why the schlumps. But, but it would make sense. In October right now, we are, for October 20th, uh, at a, a growing number, uh, currently sat, sitting at 285. Um, and my hope, my aspiration, that I hope I don't make myself a total bullshit, you know, hypocrite, liar, loser, failure at, is to to go a little more steady, go a little bit more uh, diverse in, in like, 
the way I present the show and sort of the range of content that I share. Um, and, uh, and of course, more consistent because that's, you know, rule number one, right? Obviously. And I've been treating this as like a, a fun part-time hobby and I got to like really translate it into a real serious hustle if I want it to go anywhere, I think, right? But back to the show. Here we are, folks. Um, what a long, strange trip it's been. And uh, I dare say that this is simultaneously a valid piece of sat satirical commentary, parody, poking fun of, and legit commentary. Because, I mean, this he himself used to go off about this exact same subject um, at our previous president. Uh, but um, the great wise orange one has gone golfing according to trumpgolfcount.com, uh, which has been around since pretty much the beginning because I think I referenced them early in the show. Don't sue me anybody for referencing this website. Uh, no one's paying me to reference any of the websites that I, these are just things that I've found that I find interesting. All right. Uh, 283 golf trips. And they have little asterisks. And that's defined as daytime visits to golf clubs since inauguration with evidence of playing golf on at least 140 of those visits. According to them, the last recorded golf outing was on October 16th, like just a few days ago, <laughs> of 2020. This outrageous amount of, uh, and remember he pledged? He openly, and no one cares, right? The base is like, meh, meh, whatever, you guys are so butthurt about it, blah, blah, blah. But they were also outraged and uh, red in the face over Obama's golf numbers, literally, in a sort of, you know, spewing venom, venomous anger at him. Uh, and gee, I wonder why. But uh, this is all cost the taxpayer uh, some, you know, an estimated number of a, which hits at $141 million. And that's according to a recently published GAO report. And there's a link to it. You can get the PDF, I believe, right there. So you can go dig that up, verify it for yourself. Um, politics. What do we want to talk about? What a strange and silly sport we play. Uh, and I sit at a very weird, oddly motivated, admittedly unusual, eccentric, dare I say, uh, theoretical position about it, right? Which, in my defense, uh, is what? Everybody's right? to do wouldn't you agree and um, believe it or not sort of sits outside of the normative paradigm and I try to bring that perspective to the show when we talk about things now the problem is there is an overwhelming, like we are on sensory overload times a bajillion as a culture, as a society. Why? Well, we have been truncating our own attention span for quite some time as a sort of passive-aggressive, self-undermining uh, tactic of acceptable, unhealthy, toxic, vice-like behavior slash uh, behavioral slash attitudinal norms that we've let encroach into our postmodern convenience-based 
entertainment oriented, disconnected from nature, uh, societal construct. Dare I be so bold as to jumble out that sentence at you? I mean that very sincerely. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of things we can go down. There's a lot. There's too many rabbit holes we can go down. From the fact that we are living through a moment in history where politicians and their political speech are literally and figuratively inciting violence on the streets of America. Something that some of us, if I can round up an imaginary group of fellow um, thoughtful planters of seeds and uh, givers of warning. Not just, and I don't mean to sound self-aggrandizing, but I am not alone in my voicing out of deep and great concern, not only on this podcast, but in the many other ways that I've expressed myself to others individually, directly, remotely, uh, vis-a-vis some intervening social media platform or another, um, or at a bar, face to face, or uh, etc. But some of us have been saying and waving the banner of "Hey, yo, call us crazy all you want," but it seems apparent to us that all of this madness, all of these shenanigans, are in some ways geared towards. Gently, slow-boiling y'all towards being incited to violence, which is explicitly not protected by free speech. Political or otherwise, to the best of my understanding. Now, one of the um, delightful catch-all weirdnesses about the way these things we're discussing work is something that, um, you know, there's an open, like, I don't know that I've ever, I I don't know that I've seen anyone uh, express this number as a solid, you know, like, here's the fraction of America that understands or is openly aware of this concept. Um, And I don't mean that as a judgment, because I myself was, uh, I'm sure for a, a large portion of my, you know, civic life uh, idiotically unaware of this but there's I think it's called state action oh I had this looked up and opened out as a tab and then I that was yesterday and I never got around to it because I rambled on for so long free form state action requirement uh Definition, according to a website that comes up when I type that into my search engine with the Google page. Don't sue me, Google, for using your name. Definition, the the state action requirement refers to the requirement that in order for a plaintiff to have standing to sue over a law being violated, the plaintiff must demonstrate that the government, local, state, or federal, was responsible for the violation rather than a private actor. In other words, fuck all with your free speech that only applies to whether or not the government does anything. So what does that right mean? Really? That's why I want to do a whole special on the Constitution. And uh, and the uh, the Bill of Rights. Not too long ago, if I may interrupt myself with a memory, not too long ago, within the Trumptopian era of this dilated slow motion debacle we've been living through, one of my favorite news only radio stations, which I think has to be like an NPR affiliate. Uh, wh- whose name I don't recall right now because I, I I used to have several bookmarked on my previous 
vehicle's radio buttons, uh, did a special where they had celebrities, actors, I think mostly, um, people with nice voices, uh, read the Bill of Rights. And it was fascinating and intriguing and fun to listen to. But to me, there was some element of, you know, like as a, as a consumer of that product, and I don't mean any offense, right? I, I don't mean to bring some harsh critique. I'm not trying to sound like a jerkwad that's, that's just going to complain about everything. But these are my real thoughts. Um, it was lacking. In as much as that it offered no insightful context or interpretation or application of the content read. There was no discussion of it. There was no analysis. There was no, and here's how that works in your life, sort of. And it, one would argue that uh, that's up to you and you alone to interpret. And that's a very interesting, hyper-individualistic uh, way of going about it. And I have my opinions about how flawed that approach might be. But then, you know, what is life but an endless discussion of all that, all the opinions which we don't agree with, I guess. Um, but I digress. We are a baker's dozen days away from a deeply important social ritual. And there is the full spectrum of opinions and attitudes about it. For those who are curious, I am of a very bizarre and nuanced position, which I'll go into in great detail, I'm sure, at some point. But I'm going to give you my cursory sort of surface like, here's where I stand, statement. Um, I think that, especially having lent an ear to a broad spectrum of the debate, of the discourse, the public discourse around uh, to vote or not to vote, Therein lies the question, to give it a Shakespearean turn. I think I land on the side of flooding the system with eligible legal votes. And I think there's a a strong reason why. Now, I, I think I've addressed this before on the show, and I certainly have taught, have uh, you know, attempted to express some of my thoughts on this uh, on social media over the years. Uh, there's a bit of what I there's a bit of a paradox. What I have called in the past the Schrodinger's voting box problem, right? Schrodinger's. I don't know how you pronounce that, but the physicist and the the cat in the box. Uh, in America, for the duration of my politically aware life that I have been observing politics and the rituals around it and the, the, the cycle. I'm a, I'm a big picture guy. I'm a rhythms and cycle kind of guy. I love, uh, you know, the seasons for that reason, to get poetical about it. I have found that there is this strange, curious paradox that voting is viewed by the, the broad scope of the American public in a very sort of at odds with itself kind of way. In as much as that from an outside point of view, it seems as though it exists in a paradoxical place of being simultaneously the most important, most most secularly sacred, most empowering, most valuable thing any individual uh, civic participant in the nation's uh, civic activity can participate in. And also... 
uh, simultaneously disregarded as a hoax. It is simultaneously so meaningless that many argue one should not participate in it. Also, so curiously powerful that the politicians themselves exercise their sneakiness, uh, they exercise great sneakiness and cunning in attempting to get away with discouraging us from doing it. I, and I say all this, and I want this out there for, you know, for the purposes of clarity uh, and understanding of my perspective. I can't vote. Now, we can have a, a fair, non-hate uh, speech filled discussion about whether or not I should sit down and shut the fuck up. But I think this problem applies not only at the at the local level of you live in this community, you're a member of this. I could vote in a heartbeat. All I got to do is scrounge up enough cash to buy my way into citizenship. And I have the perfectly well-established legal right to, to live and work in this country ad nauseum and forever. Um, I'm not here illegally. I'm not trying to get anything out of this country. Um, and I'm not telling anyone how to vote. If there are ideals worth believing in, independent of whatever argument you can say about whether or not any institutions are living up to these ideals or not, if we are going to reestablish ideals worth believing in, I believe in the journalistic ideal of, of, being, of being able to participate in public discourse from as nonpartisan of a perspective as possible. And given is that the whole system looks at me like as a, I might as well be a toaster oven in terms of wh how I might vote, I don't really base my discussion from that perspective, although I do have my preferences, et cetera, et cetera. But as a, as a legal permanent resident alien of this country and therefore a neighbor and a sort of silent participant in the grand experiment that is this country. Um, and someone whose life, despite the fact that I don't get to participate in the act of voting, my life is directly, realistically impacted by the results of the vote. Regardless of what level of corruption or lack of faith in the system anyone might have, you know, my statement remains true and valid, right? Like, I am a silent uh, neighboring participant. I'm, I'm here. I love being here. I'm also simultaneously sort of stuck here uh, in as much as that I have not gained the <clears throat> freedom acquired through wealth to be able to go and be anywhere I would rather be than here. Not that I would rather be here. I love it here. It's a great place. It's a beautiful country. And when everyone's not busy hating each other over made-up imaginary political ideological constructs about how to be here or how to be a member of this club here, uh, you know, it's a wonderful people. Human beings, tragically, will always live on the razor's edge of simultaneously being capable of striving towards that which is nobly identified as one's better angels and um, struggling with, you know, being seduced by one's own private devils and demons. And because of the tribalism that in my humble opinion has encroached into political thinking and political activity and political culture and political transactionalism. Like it's bad enough that politics was transactional. Now it's those two things have merged and it's hyper tribalistically transactional or hyper transactionally tribalistic. Right. From my perspective. Um, I think I sit in a pretty interesting place. 
I can, with all due respect, speak lovingly and respectfully and inclusively about this sociopathic, maniacal political system that we've inherited, that we've all been indoctrinated into, and that we've all struggled with regarding our opinions about and our positions for or against, um, and speak of it from a holistic perspective, because I'm not bound up in one of the three primary default positions. I am neither leftist, nor am I a rightist, nor am I a thirdist. You know, I'm not, a, I guess there's really four default perspective. <laughs> no one expects, expects the Spanish Inquisition. I wish I had that on like, Effects loopy clip tape. Just the funniest bit of no one expect well, all of them saying it together with like other weird sounds and funny things happening so that the audience is already laughing. There's that one perfect take from one of the many times that uh, Monty Python in their sketch says no one expects the Spanish Inquisition because they keep adding a thing. Anyway. Awkward, bizarre pop cultural reference. Uh, in this hybrid cultural realm that I call America, you know, on on the on the like pubescent edge of Trumptopianism. Uh, and we can still sort of steer the car out of that danger zone. And there's a lot of arguments about what the right path is. And we'll uh we'll probably hit those up soon in a hot minute. But to wrap up my thoughts I think it is fair and valid for me to sit back and be able to... And I know for many people, this is all laughable. This is all like, you know, armchair uh, backseat driver football coaching, whatever you call that, armchair coaching. Um, but like I was saying, the choices made and the resulting policies impact more than those who voted. There are real world impacts that hit the communities um, and there are concentric rings of communities. And I am I'm here in one of those sort of interesting positions. Uh, and I am not. So there's the four, the, you know, the four broad types, uh, leftist, rightist. That's fifth, five types. Centrist, uh, abolitionist, and sort of non-participationist. I think. Maybe I'll keep adding new labels. I don't know. Maybe there's new labels to be discovered. Oh, the third partyists. There's, there's, there are people who are, you know, the Democrats, generally describable as leaning towards the left. And there are many shades of that bucket. There are many colors to that theme. There are those generally over there on the right aligned with the GOP. There are, um, there are the, should we put the centrists over there with the third parties? Should we merge that bucket, those two buckets? Perhaps. Um, this, there is no centrist party. Each of the, the way in the, in the duopoly, if I may use that, phrase without it being too offensive to those who were really tightly wound up in one of the two parties. Um, in the duopoly, the centrists are consigned, sort of irrationally assigned to be bound up with one of the two uh, left or the right wings. And I, I would argue that in a more perfect union, the centrist party should be, could be, would be its own party. Uh, and that what America lacks is more coalition type thinking. But hey, I don't want to sound radical. And I'm certainly not a fucking socialist. Uh, let me be clear and blunt and take a, a moment to sort of maybe ground a closing place for this episode. Um, if I have a political ideology, it is that political ideologies are all sort of interesting, formally useful, now sort of rusty and molding over with corruption and potentially toxically hijacked crutches. And that the simplest way of stating it, politics 
was once how we handled civic organization. And we no longer have that holistic, heuristic, healthy point of view on politics. And that it's always been burdened by personality and the cults thereof, ego and the pits, the, the traps thereof, the pitfalls and traps thereof, right? There's, there's personality, which is in and of itself a powerful force without ego. You can have a, you can have a, a truly powerful personality that isn't a huge raging egomaniac. And then ego will get inflamed. And then there's the, you know, ego and its pitfalls. And then corruption and its many uh, sins. Uh, and we can go down many rabbit holes in that direction. But uh, let's not, right? Um... It is my opinion that a great, and some will argue that I'm borrowing this or, or uh, uh, trying to spin my own version, but truly, I think if you go back far enough and you see where I'm coming from, this has always been uh, like I, I'm reaching, I'm not stealing from anybody. You know, there's plenty of different groups talking about a great awakening. And I think that before, that the, indeed, a great awakening is coming, and I have many a things to say about awakening. Put a pin in that, dear friends, for I have indeed already rambled about it many a times in previous episodes. Uh, some of them not even ones with awakening in the in the title, and I will again come back to it. Um, but I think that prior to that fullness, that full expression which there's a lot of debate and and arguably, in my opinion, a lot of misunderstanding and potentially, theoretically speaking, a lot of garbage misinformation about what that is, might be, could be, should be. So uh, we'll come back to that. Not to frustrate you there. I know some people maybe don't want to get right on that, right? Because it's an interesting, it's an interesting whirlpool of, questions and answers there. Um, but I, prior to any awakening, true, any true awakening, there must, and one can say ob observationally, and one could argue it is beginning, it is actually happening. Uh, it, it, it just may not be happening in some of the ways that some people might imagine that it is. But there must be a great reckoning and a great catharsis. Uh, and this must operate on multiple levels. These, this, these, excuse me. I got caught up in what I couldn't quite tell if it was going to be a sneeze, a hiccup, or a burp. And thank God it wasn't one of those all three ones, because those are painful and disgusting. I just needed to burp. Uh, and uh, that's radio for you. So, what the hell was I saying? <laughs> um, oh, 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 so, okay. The community that is the American electorate is evolving, changing, growing. And that description is true on multiple levels. And people in general strive towards constantly a better understanding of themselves the surroundings, and their circumstances. And um, dare I say it, uh, I think it is true uh, that as the Trump base has so boldly declared, American po uh, politics is in need of great change. Um, but uh, as I and others, for I do not think I'm alone in pointing, trying to point this out, the system like, is self-aware enough to be savvy of that, right? So we... Where am I going? We must... Hmm. 
we must find a way to not get caught up in the ego traps and sins and uh, flaws of corruption uh, and cults, right? Like of corruption, ego, and personality. <laughs> Some would say we're way too far down that slippery slope rabbit hole ego trap already. But I would rebound that there's always um, there's always hope, for hope springs eternal. And I, as I said uh, way back in one of the early ass days of this show, one of the sort of elephants in the room is that politics functions in a pendulum manner, like a pendulum, either inadvertently or on purpose. And that's something we could debate and argue. Uh, but we've been pendulumed to one extreme and we uh and we are now sort of on the precipice of reacting and swinging back the other way uh and typically in this schrodinger's paradox voting box where we are discouraged from voting but also encouraged to think of it as the most powerful tool we have in our toolbox you know and some individual speakers and i keep failing to snag this or find this on the internet but some many decades ago a republican speaker at a republican convention said the quiet part out loud as the saying goes trump is of course abusing that which is why there's too many things like why you know he's got adhd of like breaking news that doesn't need to be news and, and creating a reset on the news cycle um so all these wedge issues divide us up into these categories the leftists the rightists Arguably the centrists, which deserve their own party. The third partyists, which are broken up into whatever many different parties. And this imagined silent majority. But I don't think that the way Trump uses it and the way Nixon used it and the way others might use it is not terribly accurate. It's sort of a, a projection. But there is everyone who doesn't vote, who's eligible to vote, but chooses not to. So, to digress, it is my humble opinion and my free speech right to express the notion that I think that community of people who have formally not participated or have participated uh, inconsistently or have advocated, you know, it's what we might call the abolitionists, right? The people who are like, we should just not vote. I get your argument. I see your point, but maybe we should just flood the system. So vote your conscience. Vote for Roger Rabbit. Sometimes I'm comedically tempted, like, if I was doing stand-up, I'd be like, vote for me. Wouldn't that be a great, like, F you to the system to vote for an immigrant, uh, you know, enter entertainment figure that's not technically allowed to take office. Like, that would be, what would that cause? I, but I don't want to propose that realistically. That would be a stand up comedy routine where I would explore the awkward outcomes of that. But let's, let's, let's return to seriousness. Trump has pushed the pendulum as far to the crazy, uh, like, irrational world of extreme rightist, political, religious, dogmatic, ideological corners for the purposes of committing the tolerance test of, like, how far can we go in that direction? Uh, with some probative uh, attempts at exploring, like, how far towards establishing, you know, tyrannical tendencies in that direction can we get away with? 
and how far can we push the limits of corruption, right? As a general assessment, without getting into the, into the thorny thicket of arguing of what, a, uh, what corrupt things one could reasonably pile up as, you know, we suspect him of uh, on that list of things suspected of possibly being true, without getting into that debate, one could draw that conclusion. And that has been my reasonable, I think, assessment of him to the chagrin and annoyance of those who support him. And I think his behavior bears out, for crying out loud. I mean, we could run down, we could spend two hours alone today just going through a massive list of all the weird... I pulled up Trump Tracker dot github dot io another genuine no one's paying me to promote that website i think to the best of my ability it is an impartial and factually accurate um presentation of the facts right where they track uh promises officially made on during the campaign and that has become that is a <laughs> It's interesting, as an issue, there's like it's 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 diminished in the in like proportionality of like the volume of craziness, right? In terms of total acts of crazy things he's said, crazy things he's proposed, crazy things he's claimed to have done that he technically sort of hasn't done, crazy things he's you know uh, presented as he that he will do. The list is crazy long. So, you know, 84 out of 174 official campaign promises not started. 18 are still in progress. He's achieved a paltry 21 of them. And some of them have like, well, but they were also sort of like barely qualifying as achieved. 43 of them have been broken. Uh, and uh, a curious number of eight have been compromised. Not to get into the whole crazy list. We did an episode of that a while back. And I don't think much has changed. And I'm fairly certain I did that episode uh, in the early, like, first year and a half, two years of his presidency, his reign in office. Where are we going and how are we buttoning up this show? Uh, Free speech is a funny thing because I want to be authentic and real and unscripted. I sometimes dive into an episode and I don't know how I'm going to wrap it up. Here we are. The world is a mess. There's way too much to talk about. And it is my humble opinion that, ah, yes, I was talking about an American catharsis requires first an American reckoning. And I think we might get it in the, a few doses. Step step away from the immediate fury, foaming fury of the political debate, and look at it from the larger perspective of you know stepping away from the pendulum, and taking a look at at the whole the whole, as large of a view as possible. I don't want to say the whole device because we don't even know the size of the whole device really. But um, <laughs> that may be too cynical. Follow me here if you can. Because I don't know, maybe I get a little crazy sounding to people. But I truly think that since, since the days that Ronald Reagan was in office, there has been a developing, burgeoning... Is that the right the pronunciation of that word? Burgeoning? Is it V or B? There's been a, 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 a exponentially growing number of people who one way or another have gotten burnt out on and or technically woke about politics. Now, what what is to be done? right, is the real frightening question. Some, many, a frighteningly, uh, you know, large number of people are falling down the 
ego trap of the only solution is some form of political violence on the street. And friends, I have said with uh, humility and compassion and, uh, and a sense of compatriotness, you know, in other words, that like, what is the point of patrioticness if not to stand in unity with our fellow members of the of of the country right um i hate to break it to anybody who has you know an enthusiasm for this these notions of violence as solutions somehow but that is exactly what the system wants and i've touched on that in multiple episodes so i won't belabor that point here but I digress that, you know, what it's distracting us from is civic activity. Getting shit done. Building the motherfucking bridges. Fixing the septic tanks that aren't working, right? Replacing the water pipes that are poisoning our people. And I say our people inclusively because this is all one big united country and everybody who lives here is our people. I may not I I may only be a legal resident alien for which I'm very grateful and I love to I I intend fully to always remain a permanent legal it says permanent legal resident alien on the card um and someday perhaps once I've uh made it artistically which is the American dream right to get here and find your niche find the thing y- you both love and are good at and that people enjoy you doing that that promotes you, catapults you into celebrity and stardom. That's the pipe dream. And dare I say it, even the pipe dream's a little bit toxic and needs to be looked at, and we need to spend some time having serious, transparent, um, self-expositive, self-cathartic, healing, critical discourse about all of it. Um... But we can't, okay, there are people who love that quote about watching it all burn down, but we can't operate, we can't proceed in a meaningful way that's sustainable if we burn it all down literally, right? And if we we do it the messed up way, and this is what the messed up way is, if we do it being led by the nose, vis-a-vis all the manipulative tactics out there that are leading us by the nose towards some, and I forgive the phrasing, some masturbatory bullshit profiteered on psyop, like, false flag edition, managed, stage managed, uh, and, and conditionally limited episode of civil violence, civic violence, civil war on the streets of America, what will we do besides butcher ourselves and give the system what it wants? As opposed to rally together to unite, to progress towards that more perfect union and heal the system. Now, some might accuse me of having not invested enough time talking about how the hell that healing is supposed to work. How are we supposed to pull that off? But like voting, right now, I'm not here to dictate teaching. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. If you want to vote for Trump, vote for Trump. If we get four more years out of it, well, fuck. You know what? I'll continue to exercise my free right speech to respectfully, but directly and, 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 and with passion, speak my, uh, my voice, even if a little bit wavering, and my perspective on the truth to that power because as uh, a, as a um, 
as a robot from the future, a.k.a. a human being, um, that loves this country and loves its people when they're at their best and their grooviest and their most Christ-like, not to get all weirdly religious about it, but there is a non-religious way to be Christ-like. And we can talk for days about that. And some of y'all get it, right? Like, I've, I I know people out there who may or may not be listening to the show, but who I've had real-life conversations eyeball to eyeball pre-pandemic. So I know that it is not something that's impossible to understand. And we'll have to put a big fat red pin on it because I've been rambling your ear off way too long. But uh, for that honor and privilege, dear friends and listeners, I have deep, deep gratitude. Even on the days that I do not put out an episode, I wake up excited and honored and humbled and in awe of the fact that somebody out there is listening to my crazy shit. <laughs> that somebody out there is listening to me ramble. And for that, uh, for that, I thank you. For being that audience, I thank you. And I leave you with this last bit of digital muzak as mixed together by your beloved and silent cartoon character friend, DJ Zed, for he is totally a robot from the future. He's like my actual robot sidekick. I Oh, 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 random before I sign off. Uh, one of the things that got me kind of going this week is that um, over the weekend, and I don't quite remember when, but over the weekend... Uh, I was hit with a bit of simple, direct, sort of uh, muse-like inspiration. Because, you know, this is one of those projects that's bigger than itself. And I want to write sort of the comic book or maybe sort of uh, illustrated novel um, or sort of digital media PDF ebook, interactive ebook story of how the characters DJ Zed and the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo first meet and first collaborate on the sort of fictionalized version of the podcast, which has mo multiple uh, retro and future historical iterations of itself. In other words, in the Zeppo universe, there's examples of, um, of Zeppo doing this in like the late 60s, early 70s as an underground. I don't know, each one is a different framework. So like in the retro historic, and I might, I'm tinkering with doing it in multiple, just keep going back further through time and keep going, just exploring future frames of reference and making it sort of like an endless hallway of, of historically recontextualized, uh, comedy radio talk if that's possible if you can imagine um you know the 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 many interpretations of like a future night in king arthur's court where someone from the future often they've been they've made this movie like a thousand times but some kid from the future time warps back to to king arthur's court and has to has to, you know, go through, uh, you know, the the rite of passage of becoming a knight and living through that adventure. Well, uh, yeah, so that's one way of imagining the way I'm imagining um, the fictionalized short story version of the podcast, um, which is crazy, right? Anyways, so I, ha I just had a weird, fun in moment of like, oh, I could totally write a story about how they supposedly meet, which is sort of like a cover story. And then there's like the secret real story about how they actually meet. Uh, but uh, imagine sort of like an odd couple, but it's it's roommates sh that share a wall that's sort of paper thin. And the DJ lives in the other room and you can never hear him talking, but you always hear him play music really, really loud. And it hit me in a fictional version because I was playing uh, real music, like actual, uh, you know, ra radio airtime type celebrity music <laughs> on, um, I 
think I was on YouTube music. That wasn't an, an endorsement. That was just a statement of fact. Uh, and I was wondering, like, in what way in a, in, a, in a literary world would I write music into the story? And I know that that's the kind of thing I would eventually, like, when I get a book deal, I'd have to get all kinds of waiver rights or whatever to be included. But I think the only way to write that is to, like, pick the songs and hope for the best, right? And I was like, oh, I would write it. And that's when the idea hit me. Like, oh, I can imagine in, like, the early, some fictional early days in one of the time frames, but not the 70s. Like, if if DJ Z, if there was a version of Mr. Zeppo and DJ Z they would meet in like the mid nineties and DJ Z is, is, you know, a total exoskeleton like robot that's trying to live undercover. Uh, and Mr. Zeppo is a cybernetic sort of artificial life form. It doesn't have metal bits. Everything looks like flesh and bone, but he's, you know, a replicant as it were. Um, both of them pretending to be normal people, both of them winding up running rooms next to each other in some, in some, and I imagine this in San Francisco. So like some house that's been chopped up into multiple flats and uh, DJ uh, Z keeps playing his music a little bit too loud when Mr. Zeppo keeps trying to do his weird recordings to create his, his underground like, audio like underground audio show that's that's distributed on tape whatever version of lo-fi i would do in each historical setting that'd be you know i can only go so far back as gramophone i guess in the in the sort of like before electricity interpretations i've had like i imagine it more like a pub crawl show where it's like he goes to pubs and like just rallies people like uh what do you call them in in dungeons and dragons like a bard and he's got like a musician friend that helps him like tell the story and maybe he's got a couple of sidekicks you know etc it's like a small not quite covered wagon of theater like in that one play oh what's the name of that one play it's a it's a spoof on shakespeare and it was written in contemporary times by a famous new york playwright and there's a scene anyways oh rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead Sort of a spin-off on that. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. You get the picture. Uh, but in order to satisfy that niche, I'm going to start a whole, like, these are my ideas for stories, and I'm going to call it, like, jokingly drunk drafting it, because uh, I'm not always drunk. Like, I am not drunk today. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, I know, that, like, ah. Anyways, you get the point. So, Yeah. That happened because I was playing music, and now I've really rambled on for way too long, friends. Uh, thanks for joining me in this bizarro madness. And to wind up the show, as I bid you farewell for today, I'll leave you with this track. And, uh, yeah, and you can just sort of imagine that short story scenario in your head for a minute. Don't steal it from me because I'm going to go and try and write it this week. And if I do write that short story, it'll be up on Wattpad. And if I don't, I'm a big, sad, sorry failure. But here goes. Uh, that's the experiment, right? This has been an extra long, double wide episode of uh, the Almost Daily Zencast special segment, Good Morning Trumptopia. And we're wrapping up the show with new Jazz Funk 101 remix, underscoring grooviness, from DJ Zed's impending imaginary album, Starting Over, Volume 7.
Until next time, may peace, love, and grooviness blossom in your hearts.